Hey, I'm Scott Perdue, and today on Flywire, we're going to talk with Tom Grisham. He's been a friend for, gee whiz, since the early 90s, I think, maybe the late 80s. Just you and me and Orville and Wilbur. That's right. <laughs> Okay, I'm Scott Perdue, and today on Flywire, we're going to talk with Tom Grisham about uh, flying and whatever comes to mind. So uh, we're just going to have fun here. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I got my uh, private on New Year's Eve, 1984, in Anchorage, Alaska. There was not a lot of daylight for us to do the check ride. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's fortunate, actually. It wouldn't have to be a very long one, right? This is true. It's, it's, it's going to get dark. We've got to hurry. <laughs> you got to hurry. You've got to get that done. There's no failing. And uh, let's get started. Okay, so uh, flying, it's good. It's good. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a serial airplane owner and done a lot of different stuff. But, I mean, I don't have, you know, I'm a private pilot. I, I'm just a guy who goes point to point and plays and, you know, had a, a few airplanes and goof off. But what I'm doing these days is flying the backcountry in Idaho and having a bunch of fun learning what that's all about. So it's interesting how you can apply what you know or have learned to that. We, we were talking earlier Slow flying is precision flying. It is. A lot of people yeah. think of only going fast as precision or, or that's the real hard thing to do. Actually, flying really slow, close to stall, you got to pay attention. you got to pay attention. To hit your numbers, you got to be, be just right. It is the numbers, isn't yeah, it? It is. And you know what? I actually, uh, you're in my inspiration. Uh oh. You're a serial airplane owner? <laughs> You and Stan Music <laughs> That's right. are, are the guys that I, I aspire to be. That's why I like airplanes. I end up... You, you do understand you don't have to do this just because we do this. You know, you could learn from us and go, those people are fools. What yeah. are they doing? What is you he know? doing? Well, he's had four barons, right? Yeah, four or five. Four or five barons. He had a, a, a twin beach. Or yeah, no, a twin, twin bonanza. Twin bonanza. Yeah, I had six, six bonanzas yeah. along the way. Well, I did have a 33, and I had the V-tail, 35, and then I had four of the 36s. Great planes. Love yeah. them all, you know. And uh, my first plane was a 1948 Luscom, and now I just bought a 1947 Piper PA-12 Supercruiser. So why not? Why not? Yeah. <laughs> so that was that was an ordeal, you know. And he flew it across country. <laughs> Bought it in Maine or something. Yeah, North far England. northeast Maine, and flew it to Idaho by way of Albuquerque, which is not the direct route. Well, there's a lot of mountains in the way. To well, go and there was route. a big weather system going across the country, and I said. I, I'm not going to sit. I'm just going to keep flying, and we'll just kind of keep going south and around. And, you know, I averaged 81 miles an hour for 3,000 miles, sometimes 55 miles an hour. And a lot of times the 18 wheelers are passing me. You know, it's just what it is. Yeah, just it's a cub. It's a cub, yeah. and you get to do a lot of fun stuff in it. And, you know, we're going to go take that and play with it. It's a, it's, not a go places plane, just kind of a fun little thing to do and classic. It's just such a classic, you know. I mean, yeah. you know, you, you've flown Cubs, you know what yeah. fun they are. Yeah, well, I don't like J3 Cubs that much. I understand. Yeah. You know, that, that, that'll tick off enough people right there. <laughs> you know, we'll put on, on, on the video, <laughs> Scott hates J3 Cubs. Oh, I'll get you a million there's, views. There's my clickbait right there. <laughs> 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 well, it's just not aerodynamically designed. It's back when they didn't know anything about aerodynamics. Well, you know, back actually, then. I'm thinking about what I'm doing and what you're doing. It's kind of interesting because you're doing uh, the training on the upset training. Right. And what I'm doing is flying slow enough, to, but I'm trying to avoid upset training because I'm usually like at 100 feet or 200 feet AGL. Yeah. You might just talk about how those two go together. Well, they actually go together really well. What I, what I do with the, uh, the aerobatic bonanza is I do uh, upset prevention and recovery. Right. And frankly, what I, and I don't teach spins. A lot of people think that a UPRT course is about spins. Mm -hmm. It's not about spins. Okay. I mean, we do spins and I teach you how to do it, but it's not to proficiency level. I'm not actually teaching you how to do spins. What I want you to know is how not to do a spin. And how to know when you're getting too close. Exactly. It's avoidance. That's yeah. the key for everything. I mean, we get there with this airplane, we can actually get there, and we can do it, and you can experience it. We can't do that with most other airplanes, but this one we can do it, and we can do it safely. Hmm. And that's the idea is, is we put you in that spot so you can, uh, you can experience it, and you know this is the edge of the world. Stay away from the edge. Right, exactly. And I find one of the problems we have with people coming out and flying backcountry is a lot of pilots, if they're flying into seven, ten thousand foot runways, they just fly too fast. Mm -hmm. They land too fast. They're eating up two thousand feet of runway while they're floating. 
And there's really no downside. There's, they, they're not paying a penalty for that when you got a big old long runway, except that if you need to land short on a short runway somewhere, they don't know how. And while that's important for the backcountry flying, it becomes even more important if you ever have to do an engine out landing somewhere. That kind of goes into all your accident uh, research you do. Yeah, all the accident reviews, and very much so, is you need to you need to fly the airplane intentionally. I like that. Everything you do, you need to have a reason for it. You need to be in control of it rather than letting it happen. Yeah, we used to have a thing in the Air Force we called fat, dumb, and happy. (laughs) Best not to be fat, dumb, and happy. Yeah, just droning (laughs) along. You know, you you are the PIC, the pilot in command, and you need to be make make it do what you want it to do. I was, you know, I don't know why people don't do it, but I think it's fun to go out and practice stalls. I think it's fun to go do short field landings, soft field landings, and work on your proficiency it, i mean yeah i'm not gonna do it all the time but i think going out and doing it uh, every month or so is not a bad idea no no and that's actually uh, uh, a month to a quarter that's actually a perfect uh, kind of a recurrency okay. kind of program so but for you guys that don't know tom very well um he has been into airplanes quite a long time and he had a tv show called wings to adventure and i was fortunate enough to be invited to help him on that show so Boy, did, did we have fun or what? That was that was actually a hoot. That was like getting away with robbery. We, we got <laughs> to do that for two years. Uh, we did two years, uh, 26 episodes a year. So we had 52 episodes. And we worked like crazy. We went all over the country. And I got a turbo-normalized A36 Bonanza. So it would go fast and they'll go relatively slowly. And we could fly it with the doors off and put a camera guy back there. This was when HD first came out. Yeah, absolutely. Right. In, right. We had the, one of the very first. It's like, yeah, $100,000, $120,000 for the camera. You know, now you can do it with your iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we put Scott in the back with a gyro mount. Scott Gayette. Scott he was, Gayette, yeah. yeah he, was, he, he wasn't actually our first videographer, but he was the best one we had. He was definitely the best. I, I ever tell you about how I ended up hiring him? Well, <laughs> just just real quick, we used to, these guys from Hollywood because they're experts. Oh, right? that was ugly. That, that was real bad. We went and did our northeast or northwest circle where we did, uh, I think we shot probably two or three video or mm-hmm. episodes worth of video. Most of them were unusable. Unusable. The guy was terrible. He was just terrible. And I've been around TV enough. I grew up in TV, as my dad did. And so I can watch a guy with a camera and go, this is not going to be good. And the first time I saw Scott Guyette, using a camera actually at Oshkosh and I'm watching him shoot airplanes and of course that's what he did he was the official videographer for EAA for Oshkosh Mm -hmm. and I'm watching him going this is the guy I want he knows how to shoot airplanes because that's a specialty right it is it is very much so so he's got a Scott guy at you got an eye man oh yeah yeah no kidding so we got to go fly planes all over we did stories on people's different airplanes and Gunny you ended up being the formation guy because I didn't you taught me look Fly straight and level. I'll, I'll join up. Don't do anything sudden. You know, I'll, I got this, right? Yeah. Because all I'm doing is flying lead. And then we would go, because we're shooting out the right side of the plane, we're always doing these left-handed 360s. Now, you talk about precision and why you need to know. I mean, we would call you and say, I need you five feet up. I need you two feet lower. <laughs> I mean, literally. We were, you know, we're because the camera guy's going, so, you know, if he was like five feet up, he'd be right against the sun. And we're getting all that. And it was beautiful. But... How many airplanes, different aircraft, do you think you flew in the process of doing this? For the TV show, I, I seem to remember somewhere between 70 and 80 different airplanes. Different airplanes. Yeah. From what to what? Give us an idea, I because mean, it, it was fun. Well, the uh, uh, speed-wise, um, we flew against the Vickers Vimy, which was doing like 65 miles an hour. Yeah. But I flew the A36. Right. Not that airplane. Right. And, but that was an experience. But you, flew, then, you flew the Spirit of St. Louis? The Spirit of St. Spirit of St. Louis, EAA has one, and I got to fly that. It, and it was awful. It was awful. It was the worst <laughs> flying airplane you could ever imagine. Man, you got out of that plane, and you were just, I can't believe that Lindbergh <laughs> flew this thing. Was yeah. it like negative stability or something? Yeah, every time you do something, you'd have to do two more things to fix it, which means you'd have to do two more things. So you're just, nah. <laughs> Sorry, this, uh, I'm going to have to get in YouTube jail for this for <laughs> assholes and belly buttons. That's, another, that's, a, that's a marine term, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, flew the, uh, the L-39. Which yeah. is pretty speedy, and on that one, I'm going as fast as I can, and you're going about as slow as you can, yeah. and still having to make a little pass because you can't slow down enough. Can't slow down in that; you're going to stall. But the uh, the the most uh, interesting airplane is uh, 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 Acroduster or Sport 
you know, Acrosport, Acrosport at Shreveport downtown. Yeah. You remember uh, that shoot we did there? Robert Balio's yeah. plane. Yeah. Well, uh, we jumped into the airplane and he didn't want to fly. And he, I mean, he put me in the front seat and there's no airspeed indicator or anything in the front seat. And this is a little short wing biplane. Yeah. And you're thinking, well, I don't even know what the stall speed is on this. Thing. Right. And he said, you're flying. I'm not flying. <laughs> so I had to fly that whole thing just by kind of. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that works. It's, well, that's a matter of feel. You're going, okay, that's too slow. Let's go a little bit faster. That's, that's, you know. But we flew all over the country. Went to Jack Brown Seaplane Base in Florida. We were up in Seattle at the Kenmore Air, you know, and doing float planes there. We flew over the place. You can kind of poke around. You may be able to find a few Wings to Adventure videos online. I, I wish the series was still around and available. It was really good. We it had was, fun. It was really good, and uh, I think it was probably the best flying TV show. But uh, it's really hard to keep that alive. Well, it is. I mean, the reality is, I mean, I'm, I'm in the media business. There's no advertising available for yeah. that. You know, the airplane companies aren't going to advertise. and not, They don't need TV. It's a bad place for them to put it. There's a lot of wasted eyeballs there. I, frankly, you know why we were able to do that? It was because the Outdoor Channel was just going HD. And they wanted to have a showpiece series. So they knew we were going to lose money, but I don't know that they knew how much money they were going to lose on this thing because <laughs> we spent money like crazy on we this did. deal. Yeah, we spent a lot of money. <laughs> Their money. Yeah. I like that. It was great. It yeah. was. It was fun. And the uh, the Bonanza was perfect for that. Great cross-country machine. So now I'm out of Bonanzas, and now I've got the PA-12 Piper and Cessna 182. Just the good old doesn't do anything best, but it does everything fairly well. And yeah. it works good. we got big tires on it. We're flying in the back country doing all that. Yeah. that's And he had two 182s for a while. He, yeah. has, he has a place in Idaho, and uh, he has a, had a 182 there. Right. He had a 182 here in Louisiana. That's where right now right and uh so he ended up selling one of those and now he's kind of settling on 182 but you remember um we met at oshkosh uh brent blue uh put this deal together for everybody in avsig at the time and we went to oshkosh and he got a bunch of camping spots right because he was a doctor and he worked with the aa so he had pulled them back in those days you couldn't do reservations right but, but he got a block yeah we all that's how we met off of avsig yeah. which was the original online group for pilots Back when it was on CompuServe. That's right. Right? Dial-up. Dial-up. 1,200 well, baht. We had 1,200 baht. That was the fast one, man. <laughs> yeah. We were speedy. It was, you could actually read the text as it's downloading it, it yeah. if you read fast. It was, <laughs> you know. So, but that, yeah, great fun. And, of course, Brent's still flying. He's out in Jackson. Um, it's uh, Jackson Hole. Yeah. And so, you know, we talk. He's actually got, he has an incredible collection of wooden propellers. I know, and he's just put them up for sale. I know, I saw that. He's, uh, he's uh, I guess he sold his practice and it was housed in the hospital and they didn't want him. So right. he didn't have any place else to go. So if you want wooden props, Brent's got a bunch. And they're collector's items. Yeah, they really are. Brent Blue out in uh, Jackson, Wyoming. So yeah. you can check that out. So where are you flying to next? Uh, well, you know, right now, the only thing I have flying at the moment, I sold two of my airplanes. The only thing I have flying is a Sturman. So it, it really depends how cold it is. You know, you would have more airplanes if you didn't keep taking them apart. I know that. I know that. And that's what's happened to Charlie right now. That's what he's, that's what he's digging me about. <laughs> is, uh, he, he, shows, he says, let me show you a picture of my plane. And it's this rat's nest of wires and stuff coming out of the panel. I go, what is that? Yeah, I took the panel off. I'm doing a... <laughs> Panel upgrade. I'm actually putting all new circuit breakers in it because it was the era where they didn't have real circuit breakers. Right. You know, not push pull kind that mm -hmm. you can reset. And uh, so I'm doing all new ones. And that required, it's actually the easiest thing to do is with the panel gone. And I want to replace the panel anyway. So, you know what the three most expensive words you can say are? Might as well. <laughs> as long as I'm here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. When you get in the middle of it, might as well. You know? <laughs> yeah, so, absolutely. Whether it's a home uh, renovation or doing airplanes, you know, it just. There it is. I uh, saw a guy who had a, he was a house builder. You'll love this because you built houses. And uh, he had a beautiful big boat. And the name on the back of the boat was Change Order. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he paid for the whole thing. Yeah. So you might want to remember that when you're building a house. Yeah, yeah. be careful about that. You yeah. know, that's the trouble with building a house, by the way, is when you, you don't know what you don't know. So you, you try to do your best, and this is what I want to do, and, and everything. And then once you get into the project, you realize it's not quite working out. So I have to do a change. Right. And that might end up with another change. Well, you know, it's why you really don't, you're not successful at it until you build your third house. 
you know, because the first two are learner houses. Yeah. You figured it all out. You know, you well, that's, that's my excuse on airplanes. Oh, yeah? Yeah. That, uh, it, that's, that. <laughs> Does anybody believe that? Well, I know no. Dana doesn't. No. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> but you know, the first thing she asked me when we were talking, I'm talking about buying an airplane is, okay, when are you going to change the engine? Really? Yeah. She knows you. Oh, yeah. I got a thing about engines. I want them to be pretty new and reliable. So you buy, you like to buy them with run out engines? Close to run out, and then uh, then uh, it's like Charlie's got two hundred more hours for it hits TBO, and then I have to replace it. So because a lot of people you know they're shopping, they want to buy something with low hours on the engine. You would rather have high time on the engine so that you can replace it, so you have a known quantity. I have a known quantity, exactly what I want. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Now there is this in- idea of infant mortality. The first hundred, two hundred hours on an engine it's actually possibly more likely to go out on you. Is uh, there anything to that? Uh, I think there is something to that, but it really depends on who it is that builds the engine. You know, if you buy, uh, an A&P can overhaul an engine. Yeah. Doesn't mean he knows how. Right. I've actually done it. I'm an a- I have an AP and IA, and uh, I've done a couple of engines, but they're small. Four cylinders, and they're pretty simple. Right. And I trust that. But anything above that, not me. And for those who don't know, there are people, you can buy a factory engine, you can buy a factory remanufactured engine, and then there are what we might call boutique builders, mm-hmm. people like uh, Bill Cunningham, Power Masters, you know, people who... Ram does one. Ram does one. Gammy does one. Gammy does one. Where you go, and it's interesting, because people will say, well, those actually cost more than factory. You go, yeah. yeah and there's because a reason. There's a reason, yeah. because, because they are better. I mean, yeah. they, they just are. They're hand-built and hand... Everything about it is just the way you want it and when you run one it's just silky smooth oh it is amazing well on my skywagon i actually had uh, p-punk uh oh mod, yeah and which is a great great version i'd taken an taken an 0470 u and then which is the the fourth order crank balanced whatever you know it's the mm. la- last 0470 they made so it's the best version that they have and i had lycon in Ca- visalia california do it well that's a good job that's it they do excellent work they are caveat and they're not paying me anything which is good because they're the the worst customer service the worst that as far happens. As scheduling. People, sometimes people who do really good work are the worst at customer service because that's they don't understand that they actually have to be in both businesses right yeah but the engine they built was amazing it was incredible so yeah, yeah. there it is you know it's uh and you said you're actually having trouble we have this whole covid thing going on and it's hard to get parts and hard, you're having trouble getting a jpi unit and things yeah. like that right now yeah yeah i'm uh i, I don't um f- for me when i fly and it well the steering doesn't have an engine monitor but it's a big radio not a big radio small radio but i'm not i never fly it very far i don't go right. cross country with that anymore but I want to have an engine monitor. To me, having knowing what is going on in my engine is absolutely required. An engine monitor is like a, a window where you can actually see inside your engine. You can yeah. actually, if you know how to interpret it, you can know what's going on in every cylinder in there. It's like having a flight engineer uh, watch everything that's going on with your engine and, and warns you if there's a problem. Right. And uh, I've, I've used DI, I've used in, uh, Insight, uh, and I've used JPI. And JPI I actually like quite a bit. And... Mm-hmm. I've done quite a few of the installs of those, and I, I really like prefer the JPI. I didn't want to do. I'm doing Garmin G3X Touch, mm-hmm. and they have their own. You can put on that. Okay. But I, you know, they're new to this business, and and JPI has been doing it a long time. And I like their stuff. And but what's happened with COVID is is we have become Europe. You know, <laughs> it is. It's true. They, you know, and what I mean by that is is in Europe, and you never live there. It's a great place to vacation, but. Uh, um, Europe is the kind of place where, well, if you want this, you're going to have to buy it from us. And you know what? It's August, and we're going to the beach. That's right, for a month. Yeah. Yeah, we're shutting down. Yeah, and that's what's happened with JPI. And, and I grant them that they're dealing with COVID. Right. And uh, there, are, there are issues with their suppliers and all that, and I understand that. But uh, their customer service is not desirable. <laughs> Say that. You were editing yourself the whole time, trying to figure out what am I going to say that about was this the nicest thing. thing How can I say this? Saying what I really want to say here. <laughs> exactly. I don't want to get censored. <laughs> exactly. I'm telling you. So, all right. I've been flying back in the mountains, and you know, we were talking about accidents, and it's a mindset, and yes. trying to get your head right about if you're switching, and it, I think this applies for night flying as well, especially in singles, is. You have to plan ahead of, do I have a place to put this thing down? 
engine failures are rare, but they happen. I mean, you investigate them all the time. In- engine failures happen. And if you're just following the yellow line on your GPS, your magenta line, it's going to run you over terrain that you may not want to put down in. And I've learned that flying in the mountains. So we'll go fly the valley, you know, and then we'll do a little bit over here. And Oh, there's an airstrip there. It doesn't mean you're always over a place you can put mm-hmm. it, but you're increasing your chances. Is that a fair representation? I think, I think it is a fair representation. It's actually a very good way to do it. I mean, when you, when you look at uh, – I think that's the way people used to fly all the time because they didn't have navigation, they didn't have GPS that draws a, here's a stake, there's a stake, and I can go direct. Mm-hmm. Yeehaw. So um, before that, you had to go to this VOR or you had to use visually that nav aid mm-hmm. or something like mm-hmm. that. So people would not go direct that much. Um, Makes sense. Yeah. Nowadays, you go direct. So that's the simplest thing. But the difference is if I, it's like if you're actually, I guess analogy really is if I'm avoiding a thunderstorm, Mm-hmm. You know, it's five degrees or 10 degrees off axis, right. and I go around the thunderstorm. How much time does that add? It, it depends, but not much. Not minutes, much. I minutes. mean, and even if it adds 10 minutes, which would be a lot for most flights, it's yeah. not that much. You know, so what? Yeah. It's, it's the old, you know, give me a, And people say, yeah, but I don't like flying. I want to be going here, and now I'm going over here. Hey, you know what? You're in an airplane. You're, You're an having airplane. a ball. Yeah. Do you want to drive? Go drive. Oh, there you go. Yeah. How look, often do you actually yeah. spend going to your destination? Yeah. L- look down at the traffic down there and say, <laughs> oh, this is okay. I- I'm okay with this. <laughs> but, you know, it really is a case of it's a mindset. We talk about in sports, you pre-visualize yeah. your event, that kind of a deal. Uh, we were talking this morning over coffee about pre-visualizing. What am I going to do if this happens? What am I going to do if that happens? And, you know, my world is the firearms world, the self-defense stuff. And what we're trying to do is reduce the reactionary gap mm-hmm. of, from the time that the thing happens to the time that you actually recognize that it's happened and then can react to it. Because you can't react or do anything about it until you actually recognize that it's happened. And more than that, that you accept it. That you accept it, yeah. And the, they've done a lot of studies about these the human reaction time. Mm-hmm. And generally, it's three to five seconds before you something an event happens and you react to it Mm -hmm. so you've got to perceive it you've got to process it and then you got to decide what to do so all that takes time and if you're not practiced and the three to five seconds is for somebody you've trained for it from somebody who's trained if you're not if you haven't done this pre-visualization we're Mm -hmm. talking about you're droning on go well i don't know maybe is the engine doing this is it running rough is it really running rough i don't know maybe i can make it over there as opposed to somebody that has your level of training where you're going okay this is happening do something about it right now. Let's not try to figure this thing out or, oh my, it's going to be inconvenient for me to land short. Yeah. Well, I think you're actually onto something here. You know, it's not that necessarily I'm the great pilot, right. but I've thought about it a lot. Yes. And I've thought about, okay, if this happens, these are the indicators that are going to tell me that it's happened, and this is what I'm going to do. So in a way, I've already decided what I'm going to do when this happens. And the best time to do that is right here on the ground talking just like we are right now and working through the, the issue and thinking, well, okay, what will it look like? And then what do I do when it happens? So then you can prioritize because I don't, I don't care how smart you are or even how much experience you have. If you haven't actually decided on the ground what your course of action is going to be, mm-hmm. you're not going to do it. Right. No, you're right. I think about the decisions we make on the no-go, no-go decisions on weather. And you make a no-go decision. You go, I'm, I'm just not going to do this. I don't like the way it looks. And then an hour or two later, the weather breaks and it's beautiful. You can't second guess yourself and mm-hmm. say, oh, I should have gone. You work with what you had at the time. And where I'm going with this is you start build up in your head. You can either build up, oh, I'm making bad decisions, or you can reward yourself for making good decisions. And then the fellow pilots, I wish we had like a, a patch you could wear proudly that says, I turned around. <laughs> You know, the 180 club, right? Yeah. You know, I, I've hey, had a 180. that's a good idea. You know, yeah. and it's like, I actually have several buddies and we call each other and we'll try to say, okay, this is what I'm seeing. What do you think? Or we'll call each other and say, hey, you know, I, I aborted a flight. I turned around and we do attaboys. Because if you start getting that feedback, you go, okay, it's much easier to make that correct decision or I'm going to land short. I'm going to make a precautionary landing. I'm going to do these things when I know I'm going to get positive feedback 
So you don't want to be the guy that tells your buddy, oh, you should have gone anyway. And, uh, I did a review of a Reading A36 accident. You know, and the point, the observation I made about going on that particular one is he was marginal. If he'd done everything perfectly, he could have flown. But he didn't do it perfectly, and mm -hmm. it didn't work out very well. My, the point I, try, I made was is you're not saving the world. In other words, this isn't a mission that's going to save the world, right. and I have to take these risks. Wow, that was a great conversation. Um, that was a lot of fun, actually, talking with Tom. There's, uh, it, it, we went on talking for another 30 minutes, and uh, um, I had to cut that off because, you know, there was some secret stuff in there, and uh, if, I, if I revealed that, I'd just have to kill you. So, you know, and by the way, that's a joke. Gee whiz. Uh, but anyway, we had a lot of fun. We talked about a lot of stuff. I can't, can you imagine talking about the zen of flying, uh, pre-visualization and all that? But it's absolutely true. Um, lots of cool stuff in that video. I really enjoyed it. Uh, hope you did too. And if you did, uh, uh, well, one thing I think you ought to get out of this video is, you know, Tom says, oh, shucks, I'm just a private pilot. Well, he's far more than a private pilot. He's very accomplished. He's flown lots of different airplanes, and he's done really well at it. And he's very intentional in the things he do does. Um, so, uh, and uh, I think you're going to get a picture of how thoughtful he is and uh, uh, how uh, he's he better interviewer than I am. Geez, maybe I could learn. Hopefully, I pick up some points. <laughs> but anyway. I hope you enjoyed the video. It was a lot of fun making it, and uh, uh, maybe we'll do a part two. I don't know. We'll do, do it again. We've got to go visit him in Idaho. That is one cool-looking place, and do some of the backcountry stuff in a 182. Sounds like a hoot. Uh, so any, if I'll take you along if, uh, if we do that, hopefully maybe next summer, you know, when things calm down. But anyway, hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, uh, hit uh, like and subscribe. The subscribe really helps me out in the YouTube algorithm. Like those too. Um, if you don't like it, well, don't like it. Who cares? <coughs> um, also, I'd like to say thank you to my Patreon supporters. I'll, uh, I'll put them right up here. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate that. You're a big help. Uh, it helps me put, uh, put these videos on because, you know, they're not cheap. So anyway, I appreciate that. And I'll put a link down below to the Patreon page if, you're, if you'd like to support me. Uh, and well, in the meantime, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time on Flower. Click this link for the latest upload. Click this link for whatever YouTube thinks you ought to watch. Or you can click this link to subscribe. Thanks for watching.